So we bow our heads together in a word of prayer. Our Father, as we open the pages of your book, we're aware that by nature our minds are blind and our hearts are disinterested. And we're aware that even though there be truth in your word, apart from your spirit to teach us, we learn nothing. So give us, we pray thee, an attentive mind and a receptive heart. And then, Lord, illuminate the pages of your book to our hearts this morning, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Dr. Tozer, who was a great preacher, and I think if there is such a thing in our generation as a prophet, he was a prophet. He wrote a book on the attributes of God, and the first line of the book he said, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Later on, he said, always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. Just as her most significant message is what she says about him or leaves unsaid, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. In the scriptures, idolatry is the greatest sin that a man can commit against God. Because idolatry is really to imagine God to be something other than he is, or other than he has revealed himself. And so when we are guilty of idolatry, the very essence of idolatry is really to libel the character of God. And so if we misrepresent God, or if we imagine him to be other than he has revealed himself, we are in God's sight guilty of libel. God has said in his word, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. A man's conception of God and what he imagines God to be like will automatically shape that man's mind and thoughts and life because really that's the guiding star of his life. And we will move in our thinking and in our behavior towards the image that we have of God. Likewise, if we do not begin with the scriptures, but begin with ourself and our own nature or philosophy or sentiment, we will move in the opposite direction and we will shape in our minds a conception of God as we want him to be or as we would like him to be. Therefore, the necessity of going to the scriptures and finding out what God is like and what God has revealed himself to be, not our opinions or our emotions or our sentiments, but the word of God is the basis of God's revelation of himself to you and to me as how we must worship him. Our second article in our Confession of Faith is on God. The first one was on the Bible, and the second one is on God. It goes like this. We believe in one God, creator of all, holy, sovereign, eternal, existing in three equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the God that we worship. That's the God that we say we are called to present to the world in our message and the God that we are to worship as our creator, holy, sovereign, eternal, existing in three equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you read this, the first thing I think that should come to your mind is the eloquence, as, as, as Dr. Tozer says, the eloquence of what is left unsaid. Because when you read this immediately, you see two things which are left out of this, which are the two extremes which are present in one generation or another generation as far as the essence of God's being. You will not find in this definition of God or this description of God the word wrath or the word love. We do not describe God as being wrath, nor do we describe God as being love. The writers and the formers of our uh, confession of faith here, I do not believe they were wrong when they did not mention love or wrath. I don't think it was an oversight. I think they were quite correct. And I think this is as good a description of the character of God in a short, concise form as you can found. find. God is eternal. God is sovereign. God is holy. God is the creator of all mankind. Now when we take this uh, portion of our confession, and when we study this, we must remember that this is not describing all that God is, 
because God is wise, God is truth, God is faithful, God is merciful, God is just, God is wrath, God is love, and God is all of these things. But this confession is describing the essential being of God. God's essential being, God's basic character, that which makes him God above all else, that which we can find to be his essential central being. And these four words which are used to describe God are the best. Neither wrath or love is God's essential being. And if we take either of these things and begin with them and say, this is what God is, we will wind up with a false conception of God and be in extremely dangerous ground and we will soon lose the truth of the gospel and a desire to win men to Jesus Christ. If we start and say that God is a God of wrath, it is not long before we'll have a monstrous conception of, a, of God. And the being which comes into our minds, if we think of God as a God of wrath, will be a being who's not worthy of worship. If I begin thinking about wrath, and every time I think of God, I think of wrath, I'll have a warped view of God. I'll never be able to appreciate the gospel. I'll never be able to have peace. I'll never be able to have comfort. There will be nothing to say to men. All I'll be able to be is tormented. Likewise, if I begin with love, and every time I think of God, I think of love, it will be not long before I will have no use for the blood atonement. It will be no, not long before I lose the, the desire to see men converted, because after all, I will have them under the love of God, and they'll be all right. There are as many people lost with the wrong conception of God as a God of wrath, as there is people lost who are trusting in the love of God. These are just opposite extremes. That's why both of them were wisely and correctly left out of our confession of faith. What is the one word that best describes the essential, central being of God. Well, it's the word which our fathers used when they framed this creed, God is holy. We believe in a God who is holy. Does the Bible really teach this? Is this what we find in the scriptures? Yes, it is. And as clear as a crystal. Well, then why is it that the conception in our generation, on every hand it seems to be, begins with God is love. Why is it that we begin with God is love? Because we take two verses of scripture in the same chapter, we add a ton of sentiment, and we come up with something which is foreign to the scriptures. And perhaps we better look at that before we start. First John chapter 4. Because the Bible does say very clearly that God is love. That's what a wall plaque says. God is love. If you look at that long enough, you'll do like the Christian scientists do. God is love, and the next thing is, you deify love, and love is God. That's what they've done. Love is God. God is love, love is God. And you just think about this long enough, and the first thing you know, you be logical and, and, and honest. If God is love, and God is everywhere, everything's lovely. And if everything's lovely, there's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as disease. It's an error of the mind. Christian science started with God is love by itself and then deified it. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, we read this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, he is not here teaching us the central being of God at all. Go down to verse 16. And, and we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. That's the only two references in the whole Bible where you will read God is love. But if you go in this same book, if you go back to chapter uh, 1 of this book, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The same thing is true over in chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. 
Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now these three phrases, God is love, God is light, God is righteous, are all the same. In 1 John chapter 1, he's saying, God is light. And if you say you're a Christian, then you have to manifest this light, and you have to walk in this light, and if you don't, you are saying something which is contrary. You're saying, one minute, God is love, or God is light. You're not walking in light, you're lying. In chapter 3, he says, God is righteous, and if a man loves God and knows God, he will do righteousness because God is righteous. And if God is in him, he will be like God, he will be righteous. He comes to chapter 4, he says, God is love, and you say that you love him, then you have to be loving. Because as God is light, so God is righteous, so God is love, so God is truth, and if you're part of him and you're in him, then you will manifest what he is like. But to take John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and build a doctrine that God is love, and this is his essential being, is to miss the whole meaning of 1 John, and also to come up with the warped view of God himself. If we go over to chapter 4, verse 9, uh, we take 1 John chapter 7. First of all, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Now look at the next verse. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world. If God is love, then it would say in verse 9, In this God was manifested toward us, in that He sent His Son. God was not manifested towards us in giving His Son, but God's love was manifested to us in giving His Son. Love is not God. God is not love. Love is one part of God. Creation manifested God's power. Calvary manifested God's love. Calvary also manifested God's truth and faithfulness and wrath. And so when John is arguing here, he is not teaching us the essential character of God, but rather love as one of God's attributes. God is no more love than he is wrath. And he's no more wrath than he is love. And he's no more wrath and love than he is righteous. And he's no more righteous than he is truthful. And so on and so forth. The danger we must avoid is deifying love. Deifying love. Don't ever think of God as essentially, totally, centrally as love. You'll be wrong, as wrong as can be. God is holy. God is holy. Is this what the scripture teaches? Yes, it is all the way through. And this is a thing that is absolutely essential. It's foundational. And as Dr. Tozer says, what we think of when we think of God is the most important thing about us is the truth. And if you in your mind, when you think of God, immediately think of love, you'll have a warped theology and you'll have a wrong gospel before long. What are the evidence of this in the scriptures? That God is holy and not essentially love. Let me give you eight reasons this morning that I believe this. Now, some of you don't agree with me in this. And it's important enough that I want to preach one sermon on it. Now, I don't ask you to agree with me, but I ask you to listen to what God's Word says, at least as I understand it, and prove it wrong or prove my interpretation or my understanding of it wrong. One time in the Scriptures, 1 John, it says God is love, no place else. In the same book, it describes God is light and God is righteous. I think they're all used the same way. But over and above that, here are eight things. Number one, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22... God is never once addressed in worship by angels or men as loving. Never once. Faithfulness, righteousness. Usually righteousness. Never once in the whole scripture is God addressed in worship as loving. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his, what? Holy name. Never loving. Not even once. Secondly, the book of Acts is the New Testament church preaching and witnessing. If we want to know how to preach the gospel, 
what the gospel is, the best place to go would be to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we do not find in any of the sermons the love of God mentioned. Now, didn't they know how to preach the gospel? Didn't they understand what the gospel was? Didn't the Holy Spirit of God give us the essence of what they said in their preaching? I read through the book of Acts deliberately, looking for this after I heard the man said, it shocked me. And then I took a concordance, and to my amazement, the word love in any way is not mentioned in the whole book of Acts. Now, is that not significant? Do we just say, well, this doesn't mean anything? That the writer of the Spirit of God in the book of Acts and all the preachers in the book of Acts never mentioned love or the love of God, and we're to say this is not significant? Oh, dear friend, I don't think we can ignore that. I think we ought to ask ourselves, why? Why? The third reason is this. There is not any of God's attributes, mercy, truth, righteousness, faithfulness, that cannot be directly associated with holiness. You can take any attribute of God in the whole Bible and put in front of it the word holy, and it will always make sense and always give you a true picture of God. He has a holy faithfulness. He has a holy righteousness. He has a holy mercy. But you cannot do this with love. Because how can God have a loving wrath? He can have a holy wrath. And he can have a holy love. And he does have a holy love and a holy wrath. But he does not have a wrathful love. That would be wrong on one extreme. And the other extreme would be to try to think of a loving wrath. No, no. God is holy. There is no place in all of the Bible where you read of one of God's acts, something God did, that you cannot say, God did this because he was holy. But if you start with, God is love, and you come down to the flood, and you say, why did God do this? Or the man in the street, or your teacher at school says, why did God do this? You say, because he's love. Because he's love. No, no. But you say, because he's holy. Because he's holy. Because he's holy. And you can go through the Bible, and there are many things that if you tried to say, God did this because he's love, you'd be mocked, and justly so. But if you say, God did this because he hates sin, and because as the holy majesty of heaven, whether he wants to or not, his governmental self did, uh, must do this, God is holy then you have a right conception of God. As I mentioned, no place is God ever called in the whole Bible the loving one. But hundreds and hundreds of times he is called the Holy One of Israel. That's what he made himself known as. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy Lord God Almighty. You'll read this phrase hundreds of times in the Scriptures. You go into 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, Joshua. In every book in the Old Testament, God is referred to at one time or another as the Holy God. In the book of Isaiah, 30 times alone in this one book, He is called the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. And not once is He ever referred to in Old or New Testament as the Loving One. Go back to Psalm 99 for just a moment. Psalm 99. I want you to look at this particular text of Scripture, and it's representative of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Verse 8 of Psalm 99. Thou answerest them, O Lord our God. Thou hast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. If you will read the Bible, you will find over and over and over and over again this one continual theme. God is holy. God is holy. The third reason I give you is this. Everything in the Bible, in Old Testament, New Testament, in heaven and in earth, that surrounds God, or that God is associated with, is always called holy. Let me give you a representative text. Isaiah chapter 57. 
Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Everything that God is associated with, or everything that surrounds God in the Scripture, never once loving, always holy. Holy angels, holy mountains, holy apostles, holy people, holy days, holy worship. Always God associates himself with this word holy. The book of Leviticus is the book of worship. Regardless of whether we take a dispensational view or a non-dispensational view, the church has always held that the book of Leviticus is the book that God is teaching his people how to worship him, how to approach him. The whole sacrificial system is instituted. Here is a redeemed people. The book of Exodus is the redeemed people out of Egypt. And the book of Leviticus is the book of worship. And 89 times in this book, this word holy occurs. Holy garments, holy sacrifice, holy praise, holy offerings. And the word love occurs twice in the book of Leviticus. And both times it has to do with our responsibility to love our neighbor, never in relationship to God. Fifthly, I say this. Those who are the closest to God, they ought to know the most about what God is like. Those who are immediately in his presence ought to teach us how to address him, how to think about him. And when we come into the book of Isaiah chapter 6, we have a revelation of what God is like. Do you want to know what God is like this morning? Do you want to know what his essential character is like? When you, when you think of facing God someday in death and giving an account of the one who created you, do you want to know what he's like? Isaiah tells us. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. What shall we do? Rise up to the angels and say, you make a mistake. Cease to sing like this. Sing love, love, love. Nonsense. You say, oh, that's the Old Testament. We read this morning in the book of the Revelation. When the church is before him, these very identical same words, holy, 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 Lord, God Almighty. Not wrath. Not wrath, wrath, wrath. That's a distorted view. Away with it forever. Love, love, love. Just as bad, another extreme. Away with it forever. Now somebody is about ready to object. You're going to say, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where it talks about love? Well, we don't have time to go all the way through it this morning, but you read it when you go home, and you compare it with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. And let me show you the difference. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. And then you go home and read 1 Corinthians 13. And all the way through 1 Corinthians 13, you'll read this word, have. If I have not love, love is something that you must have if you're a Christian. And if you don't have it, you're not a Christian. If you do not have love, if you do not have love in your heart, if you do not know how to show love to people, if you do not know how to exercise the gifts in love, you aren't a Christian, Paul says. You amount to nothing. Love is something we must have. Holiness is something we must be. We must have love. We must be holy. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15. Because he which hath called you is holy. So be you holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You'll never read anything close to that in reference to love. You can be loving and kind and go to hell. If you do not have a holy heart washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. But you cannot be holy and be lost. Holiness is something we must be. Our hearts must be made holy 
sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Ghost. And when that heart is sanctified, it's in love with the one who provided such a redemption and it loves him because of what it's done in his heart and in his life. You see the difference? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about that which comes out in his relationship with other people. It's the same with God. God's essence is, He is holy. One of the things which He manifests to us in redemption is His great love for sinners. But don't misconstrue love for the essence of God, which is holiness. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1, we were chosen to be holy. In Romans chapter 12, we're said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a sacrifice holy and acceptable. And it is acceptable not because it's loving, but because it's been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 13, Paul says, follow after holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. It is a holy God we want to know, who has loved us and given His Son, Jesus Christ, for us. What does God want us to think about Him? He wants us to think of Him as holy. Sixthly, when our Lord Jesus Christ addressed His Father, never did He address Him as loving, heavenly Father. Never once. Read His prayers, where He cries out, Holy Father. Holy Father. Always, when Jesus addressed his Father, never used loving. Jesus Christ, apostles, angels, the church, in the word of God, never once addressed God in worship as loving, as always as holy or righteous or just or faithful. Then we could go to the book of the Revelation, but we don't have time. But all through the book of the Revelation, read the prayers and read the saints and the angels and the martyrs and the apostles and others as they give from their hearts praise to God, never once loving, usually holy, sometimes righteous. When Christ is described in the beginning of the book of the Revelation, the girdle is the girdle of righteousness. He came into the world to establish righteousness does this by the giving of himself. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is the seventh argument. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Beginning to read at verse 10. God hath revealed him unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. I ask any Christian of any generation, of any persuasion theologically, if the Spirit of God is not the very essence of God. Is He not a member of the very Trinity? Is not the Spirit God's very essence? And what is He known as? The loving Spirit? Or is he the Holy Spirit of God? How can anyone speak of the essence, the central being of God as love, and then speak of the third person of the Trinity as the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God? And then lastly, Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Why is this important? Am I just standing up here this morning and trying to prove a point? No, I'm not. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ stands or falls on our knowledge and our notion of the character of the Father and the character of the Son and the character of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? The holy, immaculate, sinless Son of God, one day cried those words. 
he asked that question. Why was he who knew no sin forsaken by the Father? Why did he cry out in the anguish of his soul, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Will anyone dare to answer with the words of the Father, Because I'm love? No, no. Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not into the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praise of Israel. The answer to that question is the understanding of the gospel of the grace of God. Now listen to me carefully. I am not minimizing in any way the love of God. I am magnifying the love of God. I am minimizing love for its own sake. I am minimizing putting love into the throne of God. But I am not minimizing the love of God. I want to magnify the love of God. The love of God I want to magnify. The God we believe in. Who is the creator, holy, sovereign, eternal. I want to magnify that God's great love and mercy. In giving a sinner like me forgiveness through the greatest gift of his love. Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. Dr. Tozer finished one of his chapters in his book with these words. He's talking about the burdens which men face. The awful burdens which it seem almost at times we cannot bear them. And then he talks about one burden. That mighty burden of man's obligation to God. It includes instant and lifelong duty to love God with every power of mind and soul, to obey Him perfectly and to worship Him acceptably. That's our duty. And when the man's laboring conscience tells him that he has done none of these things, but has from childhood been guilty of foul revolt against the majesty in the heavens, the inner pressure of self-accusation may become too heavy to bear. Once see God as holy, once see my obligations to love Him and to praise Him and to worship Him, and then know the foulness of my selfishness and my sin. And then I fear judgment. This is conviction of who God is and how far I've come from Him. As the children sang this morning, a sheep that's gone astray. How far astray down into the very pig pen as the prodigal son was. Dr. Tozer goes on, the gospel can lift this destroying burden from the mind, give beauty for ashes, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. But unless the weight of this burden is felt, the gospel can mean nothing to the man. And until he sees a vision of God high and lifted up, there will be no woe and no burden. Low views of God destroy the gospel for all who hold them. That's the truth. That's the truth. Our generation does not need to hear John 3.16. They've heard it. They've seen it on every billboard. And it's true. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Thank God that's true. But thank which God? Which God? I tell a man, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And unless in his heart there is the knowledge that God who created the heavens and the earth, God who gave the Ten Commandments, God before whom he must stand in judgment, God against whom he sinned, the God he's not loved as he should, the God whose laws he's disobeyed, that God who is described in our creed as holy, sovereign, eternal creator, that God who is the God, He's loved, loved sinners like us. You see how this magnifies the love of God? Put God in His throne as He is and then say, That God was willing, why we'll never know, but He was willing to give His only begotten Son for sinners like you and like me. Oh, now your heart rejoices. 
Now you can sing of the love of God. Now you can testify of the grace of God. Now you have something to say. Now you have something to say. Lose the truth of who that God is. Doesn't make any difference whether he loves us or not. Doesn't make any difference whether he loves us or not. But it makes all the difference in the world whether the God who made me, who created me, the God who spoke on Mount Sinai, the God who wrote in my conscience a junior Mount Sinai, the God who would not even spare his own son because he hated sin, and if he's to save sinners, he must punish sin. The God who raised his son from the dead and exalted him to heaven and gave him all power and all authority. The God before whom all creation fall down and sing, holy, holy, holy. That God, how oh, I'm concerned whether he loves me, whether he'll forgive me. And the message of the gospel this morning is that God who's holy and high and lifted up. You come in repentance and you come in faith. You need not fear. If you come in any other way than repentance and faith, come with anything else on your lips except the precious name of Jesus, and you'll not see his face in love, you'll see his face in anger. But oh, man, woman, boy, girl, fall down before him in repentance and faith. Breathe out the name of Jesus Christ as your only hope and your only plea. And you'll discover forgiveness. You'll discover assurance. And in your heart there'll be worship. And there'll be praise that shall never end now or throughout eternity. That's the gospel. Lose the gospel. Nothing to preach. Lose the truth of who God is. The gospel is indeed. That's our problem in our generation.